Do you all know that the third Sunday, thank you, of Advent, if we were lighting Advent candles, the third Sunday of Advent is joy. Now you may remember last week, we were in the Advent week of peace. And you may remember, thank you, Pastor Andrew, that all we prayed for last week during intercessory prayer was peace. How many of you felt a little more peace in your week this week? I know that I did. And I find it fitting that following a week where we asked for peace, we've had a service today that has been filled with so much joy. The song they just sang said, Rejoice because the Lord is here. And we are in week three of our Relationships series. But you can't forget the subtitle, y'all, because the subtitle of our series is The Gift of Incarnation. The entire series this month is called Relationships, The Gift of Incarnation. What does incarnation mean? It means he's here. It means that the Lord came in human flesh in the form of a baby, born of a woman, intentionally that he might redeem us. Rejoice, the Lord is here. If that's good news to you, won't you put your hands together and give God praise. Hallelujah. 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 Well, y'all, it is preaching time. We're in week three of our series. Uh, this week, we are in relationships, shifts of expectation. We've been on a journey, y'all. Uh, two weeks ago, we started off this series, Relationships. The first week was Shifts of Loss. And then last week, Pastor Andrew preached to us about shifts of trust. Amen. And now today, we are in shifts of expectation. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 30 through 33. Y'all go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. Luke, chapter 1, verses 30 through 33. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. You may go to your seats. I'm going to tag this sermon with the title, Is This Your King? Is this your king? Pray with me. God, we expect you. Now have your way, in Jesus' name, amen. Y'all, by now you likely know the story of the birth of Jesus. If you've been coming to church a little bit, this is one of the first lessons that we get when we come to understand what it really means to be a Christian. You see, this part of what we profess is what separates us from the Jewish faith, it's what separates us from the Islamic faith, that we believe that Jesus was not just a prophet, that Jesus was not just someone who was a good man, but Jesus is quite literally the son of the living God and a part of the Godhead, God in three persons. God is a part of the Holy Trinity, and God the Father chooses to send God the Son to the world to redeem us for our sins. If you don't understand this, if you don't believe this, then you might not be a Christian. Can, can we talk plain today? 
I mean, I'm looking at folks who come here every week, so I feel like I can be playing with y'all. And I feel like those of you streaming, I feel like if you still rocking with us, I can be playing with you too. So let me help you. If you don't believe in the birth of Christ, if you don't believe in the divinity and the humanity of the baby Jesus, you might not be a Christian. Because historically, folks can trace that there was a man whose hair was like lamb's wool and feet like bronze. They, they, they can trace that Jesus existed. Ain't no argument about whether Jesus walked the earth. I don't care where you go. I went to Yale. They'll tell you at Yale. They'll tell you everywhere else. They know that Jesus walked the earth. The argument is not, was Jesus here? The argument was, was Jesus divine? The place where we get into debates at barber shops and hair salons. It ain't about whether Jesus existed. The Islamic brothers and sisters will say, oh, he was very wise. And, and he, said, he said many good teachings, right? They're they not going to argue with that. The Jewish brothers and sisters, they're not going to argue with the fact that, that God has a son named Jesus. They just don't know that it's necessary for you to be in relationship with. That's why they do Hanukkah and not Christmas. Can I teach on a Sunday evening? But if you're a Christian, you got to wrap your heart, mind, soul, and strength around this concept that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would love come on y'all I mean do I have any Bible believing Christians in the building oh y'all should be louder than that I'm talking to my team do I have any Bible believing Christians in the building we get excited for different reasons at Christmas time because it reminds us rejoice He's here. The long-awaited Messiah has come. Christmas is a reminder that God's going to do what God said God would do. Christmas is a reminder that no longer, have, no matter how long you have to wait for God to do what God said God would do, Christmas is a reminder that you're not crazy when you stand on the promises of God. Christmas is a reminder that even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, I know that I might not get there with you. That's what King said, but I know it's happening. Christmas is a reminder that God will do what God said God would do. Why is that? Because all throughout the Old Testament, we get predictions of who is to come. A Messiah is coming. It won't always be like this. We just went through eight weeks of freedom ain't free. Where we told y'all about the bondage that the people were in. We told y'all about the ways they had to fight Pharaoh and fight the waters and be in the wilderness. And they, they were unsure of where deliverance was coming. We told y'all all about that for nine weeks. And Christmas reminds us. That when God says God's coming, he's coming. And so we're in week three of this relationships series. And I, and I hope that y'all have been walking with us each week. And I want to shout out our YouTube audience because some, somewhere in the middle of the week, I, I see all these comments. And I'll be like, who is commenting? But YouTube, we love y'all because y'all watch it in the middle of the week. And y'all be commenting like it's Sunday afternoon. And I appreciate that. Amen. So for everybody, wherever you've been catching it, if it's been in person, if it's been online, if it's been in snippets, I don't care how you're getting it. We appreciate you for walking with us. And we have arrived at week three. And it's time to talk about our expectations. If you are a Christian, you ought to expect God to do what God said God would do. Okay? But many of us have been wearied by life. And we no longer expect anything good of God. And what happens is we mark time, we show up, we do what we've committed to do, we uphold our commitments, but we have no expectations. Attached to expectation is the ability to hope. Talked about this two weeks ago, first week of Advent is hope. 
I told y'all when I was preaching that, that black folks have been robbed of our ability to hope. That's why I said we would not be consoled, but we would be resolved because y'all not going to rob us of our ability to still be hopeful even as we continue to lose the things we never anticipated losing. We talked about that two weeks ago. But, but if you are to be a people of expectation, you've got to be a people of hope. Hope is the four-letter slogan that got a black man from Hawaii elected as the president of the United States. Hope is the thing that kept all of our ancestors going and believing that better was possible even while they were literally dying in the midst of the fight, they still had hope. But expectations go beyond hope. Y'all with me? Okay? If you're in the comments right now, help folks walk through my sermon with me. Go ahead and type this for me. Expectation goes a step beyond hope. Thank you, CJ. You led us in a call and response. I appreciate you, brother. Expectation goes a step beyond hope. Hoping is I really have not given up yet. And some of us, the lives we've lived, that's a praise in and of itself, <laughs> right? Just the fact that, you know, for some reason, the data don't back it up. My life ain't really backing it up. But for whatever reason, you're that person that keeps a smile on your face when you show up for your shift. You're that person who has an encouraging text message in the group chat. You're that person that everybody's like, of course you would say it's all right. You're that person. For whatever reason, you still got hope and God bless you because we need more hopeful people in the world. But expectation goes a step beyond hope. I want us to be people of great expectations. And the shift that happens in our lives when Jesus comes in the form of a baby is that we can expect things to change because Jesus is physically here. Right? We, 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 we now go beyond a hope that a Messiah will come, a hope that somehow, someday, some way, we gonna get some help, some divine help that's greater than us. We move beyond that when we get to Christmas time and we move to expectations, realistic expectations that stuff is gonna shift because Jesus is here. We already told y'all that Jesus is a disruptor. And so when Jesus shows up, stuff shifts. And if you're not shifting nothing, you also might not be following the way of Jesus. Because when Jesus shows up, things begin to shift. That's why we're talking relationships. But when Jesus is present, expectation is present. And expectation is a step beyond hope. Expectation is what separates entrepreneurs who are serial entrepreneurs who start a lot of stuff and walk away from it and business builders who stay with the business until it produces what they intended for it to do or better yet, until it produces what they expect. Pastor Andrew and I have great expectations for double love. We're going to stay with it until it matches what God showed us in our prayer time. I ain't got no help in here. We have expectations. I don't just have hope that this church is going to do what it needs to do in the world. No, no. I expect it to do what it's supposed to do. When I get testimonies about double love, I expect that. I expect signs and wonders. I expect miracles and blessings. I expect God to do what God said God would do. This ain't no hope. This ain't no uh, pride in myself. I expect that because God is here, things will happen that align with what God said. I expect it. When I get them text messages of testimonies, I expect it. When I run into people in the streets who know about DLE, I expect it. Because God is here. 
And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And let me tell you something about black folks. We're going to always find our places of freedom. We're going to always find our hush harbors. We're going to always find the places where we can go before God for ourselves. We're going to always find each other. It may take a while. I may not find you for five years. But when I find you, I'm not leaving because I know what I found. I expect that. I expect that. Expectation goes a step beyond hope. Before we opened these doors, before we found this launch team, before we had a place that was ours, I hoped that God would do what God said God would do. But once those things came into alignment, I expect great things. And we will not take anything less. Is that for us. What do you expect? Because Jesus is present. Where is Jesus so present in your being, in your work, in your demonstration that you expect something of God? Because if we have no expectations, we will accept anything. If we have no expectations, we will take the scraps from the table and call it bread. If you don't expect to eat a good meal, then when you show up somewhere and all they got is crackers and cheese, you're going to eat that crackers and cheese thinking it's a meal because you ain't expect nothing. But when somebody says, come to my dinner party, and you get there and it's crackers and cheese, you say, oh, hold on, wait a minute. Y'all told me it was a dinner party. I expect dinner. Where my foodies? This must be an appetizer. Can't be the whole thing because you told me it's a dinner party, so I expect, and I ain't leaving till I'm full. Evelyn said five courses. See, 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 it's always one. It's always one. We ain't say five courses. We ain't say five. We said dinner. That ain't no, ain't no courses in there. Amen. But, but it's always one. But, but, but what do you expect? Because Christ is here. It's a real question. What is, what is in your life that before you really believed God, and, you know, a lot of us grew up in church, and we, we went through the motions, right? We knew when to say hallelujah, when to say amen. We knew when to fill in the dead space. We knew when to do a little shout. We knew what what the scripture to read. We we knew how to play church. But but when you stop playing church and start being the church, your relationship to the incarnational Jesus changes. Because Jesus then is not just a subject you've studied or a relationship you've performed because we do a lot of performance but when you're really in relationship with Christ when Christ is actually there with you when when you get convicted when you say the wrong thing and you find yourself sucking your teeth and apologizing because the Lord ain't gonna let you rest till you make it right when you in that kind of relationship with Jesus your hope should move to expectation And from that expectation, you build your life. Are y'all with me? You don't build your life only on your hope. You build your life from your expectations. Can I walk through what I mean by that? Okay. If, If you're building your life, not just based on what I hope, I hope one day I have dot, 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 and again. Hope is important. It's first week of Advent. Hope is what we focused on. Hope is, we got, you got to have that, right? But, but if that's all you have, you are directionless if you have hope without expectations. Directionless. You, you, yeah, this seems cool. This, this seems good. Well, I mean, I might be able. You just kind of, you don't really go forward. You just, you just go in circles, right? You're happy, you're happy, and you're pleasant, but, but you don't have any direction. But when you build your life from the expectations you have of your life, that's when you begin to say, no, thank you. This does not meet my standards. I expect different in my love life, in my professional life, in my familial life, in my friendships, 
in my housing environment? Where are my people who have expectations of how they will be treated, of how they will be engaged, of how their intellectual property will be managed, of how their work will produce a profit and where they will not be indigenous servants to people who don't care about them? Where are my people who have expectations of themselves, who know that they good? Where are my praise team members who know you can sing for real, for real, so you ain't gonna just show up for anything? Where are my people who understand that I have an expectation on myself based on who God is and who God has created me to be? Build your life from your expectations because Jesus is here. That ought to shift what you expect. And you build from there. It does not mean you will not have instances where what you expected has not happened yet. Okay? I'm not talking to a sold out room, but I expect it. The people are coming. I know they are. They're not here right now. But I'm not building, watch this, Holy Spirit just gave this to me. I'm not building what we do for double love based on what I see right now. I'm not building what we do for double love based on my hope that one day. I'm building what we do for double love based on the expectations of who we will be. You build your life based on what you expect. Because Jesus is with you. Is there anything too hard for our God? You build your life on what you expect. I'm getting happy because Jesus is with you. And, and who, if God be for me, then who can be against me? You build your life on what you expect. And that's how you say, Lord, teach me to number my days. You build your life on what you expect. And then you don't have all this filler time where you ain't doing nothing about nothing. Because when you build your life on what you expect, there's always a vision that God has given you. There's always work to be done. There's always relationships to be stored after. There's always dreams to dream. When you build your life on the expectation of what it means to be you with God with you, you have no time for foolishness. No time for people who can't see what you see. They can be around. But they can't be in your inner circle. You ain't got no time for that. Because they don't see what you see. And, 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 and watch me. When, when you get to the thing that you've already known was coming, they're going to be there supporting you and let them cheer for you. But they don't necessarily need to be with you in the innermost moments when you're ready to quit. When you're ready to build your life on hope instead of expectation. Go where you're able to agree with people who agree, I'm sorry, find with people who agree with what God has shown you, you should expect. Y'all with me? All right. I got three points. I'm going to give them to you all at once. Get your, get your notepads out. Give it to you all at once. We're not going to be here much longer. Right? Three points as it comes to expectation based on our scripture for today. Y'all ready? Y'all got your phones? Whoever's on comments, you ready on, on, on Facebook for me? All right, let's go. Point number one, greatness is never generic. Greatness is never generic. Okay, that's point number one. We're talking about expectations. Point number two, inheritance is intentional. Write them down and we can go through them. Inheritance is intentional. Third one, last one. Rain requires responsibility. Rain, R-E-I-G-N. Kings and queens reign. Your kingdom will reign forever and ever. Rain requires responsibility, right? Okay, the first point that I gave you, that aligns with Luke chapter 1, verses 32. 
Second point that I gave you is also Luke chapter 1, verse 32. Third point I gave you, Luke chapter 1, verse 33. Y'all got them? Can I run through them now? Because y'all be like, Pastor Gabby, you go too fast. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to slow my roll a little bit, but I'm happy. So y'all got them? Can y'all talk back to me? All right, amen. Okay, thank you. Why y'all make me scream? Why? Why y'all? It's like, it's like the school teacher. Like, why y'all make me? Why, why y'all couldn't just say okay later? Okay. All right. So listen here. Listen here. Listen here. Because we're going to get out of here real soon. <laughs> Luke 1, verse 32. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Greatness is never generic. Okay. When you begin to build your life based on expectation, you move away from generic prayers and generic expectations, okay? When you build your life on hope, I hope my daughter is like Michelle Obama. I hope my daughter is like Beyonce. I hope, I hope, hope is generic. It's not problematic, but it's not specific. Expectation that we're building our lives from is specific. Text says, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Jesus who's coming being born of Mary, he's gonna be great, yes, but there have been many great ones before him, and he ain't like Moses, he ain't like Joshua, he ain't like Elijah, he ain't like Samuel, he ain't like none of them that you've heard before. He will be the son of the Most High. Greatness is never generic. There is an individual story from Martin Luther King Jr. that does not match Sojourner Truth, that does not match Ella Baker, that does not match Frederick Douglass, that does not match Michelle Obama, that does not match Oprah, that does not match anybody you insert. Anybody that you value has a specific level of greatness. If it was generic, they would be like everybody else. Greatness is never generic. What does that mean? Malik, I can't tell you what greatness will look like for you. We haven't seen it yet. It ain't generic. You might have some hope that you might be like some folks you love and admire and we give God praise for them, but the Bible says he will be great and the son of the most high specific. Because the Lord has come, you ought to have some very specific, God, I've seen what you've done for others, but I want you to do something for me in my name. What do you want me to do? What is Gabby called to do? What is Andrew called to do? What is Ashley called to do? What am I called to do for your glory? What am I uniquely equipped for? Because the greatness inside of me is not generic. I expect greatness that that is not like everybody else. I have models of churches that I love, but I know DLE ain't going to look like none of those because there is a specific calling on this church. Greatness. Anybody you admire, they will have their list of people that they uh, were inspired by, that they hope they would one day be like. And then they have the mold that is themselves. Greatness always has its own mold. If you expect to be great, you've got to also expect that it's going to look different than everything else you've seen. And that sounds good when you're on the other side of it, but it's painful as all get out when you're becoming. Where are my people who know that you've got a different kind of call on your life? 
And it's hard for you to have just one mentor. It is hard for you to have just one best friend or hard for you to have just one colleague in your industry because everybody gets pieces of you, but nobody understands the fullness of how you see things and the fullness of how God has given it to you. Where are my people who have great expectations for yourselves? Because one day in prayer, Jesus told you who you were. One day in prayer, Jesus deposited into you who you would be, and you saw signs and wonders and vision, and now here you are trying to get a piece of it here and a piece of it there and a piece of it over there and folks think you're scattered and you're not scattered it's just greatness is never generic and so I can't get what I need from just one place and so I got to submit myself to the places that are feeding my soul where are my people who know that you expect greatness over your life and greatness is never generic Anyone you believe is great, whether they are Alvin Ailey, in any, any industry that you represent, people did not understand them when they were becoming. Hindsight is always 2020. Remember that. There are artists like Van Gogh and Monet whose, whose albums did not, not albums, whose, whose artistry and their portraits did not sell the way they sell until after they were dead. There are composers like Mozart and Beethoven. Beethoven is black. Y'all know that, right? Uh, but there's, 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 <laughs> there are composers and folks like that who were not appreciated, who broke the mold. Where, where are my people who understand that greatness is never generic if people can make sense completely of what it is that God has put on you guess what you are functioning in your comfort zone if folks are like yeah I get it I get it I get it I get it, I get it. cool thank you bye you in your comfort zone family okay, let me tell you something fascinating about comfort zones at one point your comfort zone scared you can I talk to some creatives? Come on, creatives, put your hands up so I know you were here. What about DLE creatives? All right. At one point, your comfort zone that you're currently in scared you. At one point, you weren't confident enough to have meals with June Ambrose and things. At one point, you weren't confident enough to be playing with Todd Tribbett and things. And at one point, you weren't confident enough to be out here in the Harlem streets with your camera and your bag, booked and busy. Uh, at one point, you weren't confident enough to do all of that. What you're doing right now at one point was not your comfort zone. It's what you reached for. But now, beloved, you've got more greatness on the inside of you. And so now, beloved, greatness is never generic and so if people can map everything you're doing you might still be in a new comfort zone and God needs to keep pushing you towards your greatness you need to expect more you got to expect more where are my people who expect more because Jesus is with you. Where are my folks who expect more? Because the things you're doing right now, you never believed you would be possible of doing. The things that are under your belt. Ashley gave a TED Talk at Columbia University. The things y'all have done, I could go down the list. And at one point, you would have never thought possible. But beloved, it's time to push past. Break that generic mold and go further. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. But inheritance is intentional. Here's what the word says, still in verse 32, the second part of verse 32. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Okay? Inheritance is intentional. We do not walk the earth as the beginnings of our stories. You may not like your family. You may not enjoy time with your family. You may feel like a misfit in your family. But inheritance is intentional. You may not understand why you're a square peg in a round hole, but there's something about those who have gone before you that God intended to be connected to your next. 
And it's up to you to figure out what that is. Okay? David was a king. And we know David for being a king who reigned for a very long time, who was a successful king, a very beloved king. But David's story did not start out as a beloved king. David started off as the son at the house where his daddy didn't even bring up his name when the prophet was coming to anoint the next king. David started off as the one who was left out, who people didn't even think he was worth bringing up. David was the scrawny one. He wasn't the one that had the build and the look of a king. And so when David becomes king, it breaks the mold of expectations of who is supposed to be king. And the Bible says when God is telling Mary who she's carrying, that not only will he be great and the son of the most high, which is not generic but specific, but the Bible also says that the angel tells Mary the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Just like David was not expected to be king, people will overlook Jesus. Just like folks didn't think that David was the one that folks were looking for, people overlooked Jesus. There's something in your inheritance, there's something that that, that precedes you that helps you understand where you come from. And you need that understanding to help ground yourself in some intentionality. How many of you have looked at the stories of your families and realized, oh, wait a minute, we had some other preachers in the family? I didn't know that. Wait a minute, we had some other sound engineers in the family? They were were out there before they had boards making stuff happen? I didn't know that. Inheritance is intentional. Never knock where you came from. Because can I help you? Being a part of the tribe of David, uh, of the lineage of David, like it wasn't as sexy back then as we make it seem now. Because we know the end of the story. But, but like, Lord, I can't, I can't be in the lineage of, you know, one of those great kings that ruled forever, that everybody knew was king, who was born into royalty. No, you're going to be in the lineage of David. Inheritance is intentional. When you are building your life off of the expectations that you have for your life, you will take comfort in learning about what the family who's gone before you has already experienced. Somewhere in there is a narrative of somebody who faced what you faced and made it over. Y'all don't believe me. I'm not talking generic. I'm not even talking about famous people. I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about your family. Your family. If you're adopted, I'm talking about the folks that raised you. I'm talking about the people that God intentionally put you as a part of their story. In their stories, you will find the conviction to go forward with whatever it is you feel is too big for you. Last point and then I'm done. Luke 1, 30 and 33 And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Reign requires responsibility. It's cool for you to change your expectations, to only expect great things. But there's a responsibility attached to you living in the fullness of who God has created you to be. Bible says he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. Hashtag no days off. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. That sounds wonderful when you're not king. Sounds great when you're not a queen. But when you understand what it means to operate at that level, when you read scriptures that say it will never end, be like, Lord, uh, you can keep this. Uh, I Actually, I'm good. I'm going to take that generic blessing. I'm going to get out your way. The, the history books don't have to remember me. I'm, I'm fine. 
When you actually become acquainted with what it means to be in the kind of leadership role where your job does not end when you go home after you clock out. When you understand that your influence does not end after you log out of social media. When you understand that rain requires responsibility, let me make it plain, being at the top of whatever your field is comes with responsibility. It comes with people looking to you and if you're a Christian, the expectation is even more uh, uh, intense because they anticipate that wild and crazy thought that you're going to be like Jesus. They anticipate that if they're having a hard day, they can say that to you. And if you have control over their schedule or control over their work output, that you might be humane and actually allow them to take a little bit of time to regroup because you are a Christian. They assume that you've got some Christ-like qualities. But let me tell you something. Every time you give somebody else permission to be off, more work is on you. Where are my leaders at? Where are my lead? I, I mean, Facebook, y'all with me? Where are my leaders at? Every time you make it easier for somebody else, rain has responsibility and the kingdom is without end. There's still work to be done. Somebody still got to get this work done. Somebody still got to put this train in and push it forward. Rain requires responsibility. And so when you shift into great expectations, you've got to be grounded in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. What I mean by that is this. When you are reigning in whatever your field may be, you better have Jesus with you to give you a different level of strength, a different level of capacity, a different level of discernment, a different level of wisdom, a different level of ability. You better be with God because if you are trying to reign on your own, guess what? The reign has no end. So we on our knees praying for things and praying for God to do. But, but, but guess what? When God gives you, when God showed you, you've got a responsibility attached to that for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life. For the rest. Somebody needs to hear this. For the rest of your life. All my 20-somethings in here. For the rest of your life. For the rest of your, I, I mean, it probably is already happening. You be in the grocery store. Somebody, is that so? Is, I seen them. Okay, cool. Like, I follow you on social media. I heard for the rest of your life, you've got a responsibility to whatever it is that you've asked God permission to reign over. And so here's the shift. Here's the shift. You're never reigning alone when Jesus is with you, right? His strength is made perfect in our weakness. But if we get too cocky and don't rely on God and that responsibility gets real, that's when you start seeing scandals coming out and folks falling from high perches and being stripped of everything they had. Because I don't care how high you rain it, it could be gone like that. But if you are responsible, if you're relying on the gift of incarnation, the fact that Christ has come, if you are building your life on the expectations of who God has created you to be, then the work that you do will last beyond you. Amen? Man, we're going to end it there. I want to pray over you. God, I ask you right now, that you might begin to shift some expectations in this place. Somebody's aim is too low. Somebody pushed themselves out of their comfort zone two years ago, but they still sitting in that same place and you have more for them. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that when we think about Christmas, it won't just be about the Christmas trees and the gifts and the cards and the family time but it will be a reminder that you will do what you said you would do. 
it will be a reminder that you are here with us now. And because you are here with us, our reach should look a little differently. Lord, teach us to number our days. Help us to stop wallowing and wandering and not doing the things that we know that you're calling us to. Help us to shift from hope to expectation. Help us to build from expectation. Help us to dream from expectation. And God, when things look differently than what we expected, help us to continue to go before you in prayer. And if it still aligns with what you said, help us to go forward anyhow with empty seats. Let us go forward anyhow with books that won't sell. Let us go forward anyhow. With albums that don't break number one, let us go forward anyhow. With work that we've produced that we're proud of, that it seems like ain't nobody reading, let us go forward anyhow. Because in the work, somebody is being blessed, hallelujah. In the work, Signs and wonders are happening somewhere. They may never get back to us, but God, we know that your word will never return void. Ever, ever, ever return void. And so, God, I ask that you would increase the faith of your people tonight. Give us great expectations. Give us the confidence in knowing that, that whatever you've created us to be is not generic, but it is specific. You have specific work for us to do. You have specific ways for us to be in this world. You have specific relationships for us to align with. God, we know that our inheritance is intentional. You put us in the families we are in for a reason. You put us in the neighborhoods we are in for a reason. You put us in the schools we went to for a reason. You put us in the environments we are in for a reason. God, help us to know that when you do it, when you allow us to reign in our fields, in our finances, in our households, wherever we may be, God, help us to know there's responsibility attached to that reign. Help us to know that we need you more than ever when we make it to where we've prayed for, when we make it to what we asked for. We need you more than ever then. God, we thank you that we've made it to this week of joy. We thank you, Lord, that in this week of Advent, we are joyous and anticipatory, and we know that you're about to do something extraordinary. So God, shift us from hope to expectation. Come on, lift your hands. Say, Lord, shift me from hope to expectation. I expect you, I expect you, I expect you, I expect you, come on, I expect you, I expect you, don't get tired, I expect you, I expect you, I expect you. That's the prayer, Lord. I expect you. In Jesus' name, amen.